Joining us on another episode of the Real Talk on Women's Health podcast with Essentia Health, we have pediatrician Dr. Char Valentine. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. I'm excited to get to know you a little bit more. So can you kind of talk about why you decided to go into healthcare for your career? Oh boy, I was a biology major in, in college and, you know, decided, you know, like many people that I wanted to, you know, help people and be involved in science. So going to med school and eventually pediatric uh, residency was definitely a, a calling and something I'm uh, very fortunate to be able to do. Yeah. So there's so many different facets of medical, the medical industry, like what you could have chose to go into. So what about pediatrics kind of called to you? You know, it was being able to work with somebody from birth until their early twenties and being able to see the children and families um, kind of grow up and get to know the families that's the big draw. We've had a few other pediatricians in here as well. And they said the same thing, like they really enjoy getting to see like a child from when they're born all the way till you know, they send them off. So that has to be pretty rewarding. Yeah, I've got a few patients who, you know, have grown and now have their own family and and take their child to, to see me now. And that's really gratifying. So I guess... I am not an expert on this. I don't have kids, but when does a patient transition from one doctor to the next, like pediatric care to adult care? When when does that happen? Typically um, before they start college. So we, we get them through uh, high school graduation and then, then if they need a college uh, physical, we'll do that. And, you know, there, there are patients until we actively transition them to an adult provider. And so we spend a lot of time, you know, in the later adolescent years talking about the skills they need to navigate that transition. And we are here to help them um, pick somebody and help to ensure that it's a smooth transition from pediatric to adult care. So speaking of teenagers, what should parents be aware of that they might not think like in terms of, you know, you have a growing child, so many things happen during that time and whatnot. What are some of the most common things maybe that parents ask you that you want to share with other parents about their teenagers? Well, I would say first and foremost to to enjoy them. Many of us feel like I, my kids are 17 and 15 and it's it's hitting home how they may not be at home for very many more years. So the first thing is, you know, adolescence comes with a lot of push and pull, a lot of peaks and valleys, but to to enjoy your teens the best you can. I, I get a lot of information and input from a therapist and she has her own podcast and I listen to that. She's written books and I, I get a lot of information. Her uh, podcast is Ask Lisa and it's Dr. Lisa Demore and she is a, uh, like I said, a writer and a New York Times bestseller and she's uh, written a book book um, called Untangled and that helps uh, us figure out our adolescent girls. And she recently came out with another book that I'm really excited to read called The Emotional Life of Teenagers. So I I do get, you you know, it's it's nice to hear experts talk about um, the teenage brain and how to help our teens transition through all the stages into adulthood. And and so, yeah, I I try to educate myself um, so I can help my families. So speaking of teenagers, again, what is something that maybe they should know about their health when they're transitioning, you know, and they are teenagers because there's just so much going on. What are some like basic things that they should just be aware of off the bat, maybe not panic about things like that? Well, I would say we, we start early, you know, when, when you're a patient in a, in a pediatric practice, uh, you know, families and the, and the patient will notice that we address questions to them at a very early age. We're interacting with toddlers and we listen to the stories that our elementary school patients tell us. And in middle school, we're definitely asking our patients to sit um, next to us by the computer and we'll talk to them about uh, their medications and their diagnosis in the computer. And we really are directing our questions uh, towards the um, the young person. And, you know, the, the parents are, they are there to add in and give feedback and answer all the parents' questions as well. But we really want to start getting the young person involved in their own healthcare. So I remember vaguely when I was a teenager, it was a long, long, long time ago now, but what are some tips that you would have for parents to stay connected in their child's life when they're, or I guess they wouldn't be children, but what are some tips that you have for parents where they can stay connected to their teenager as they're kind of trying to tackle those teenage years? You know, I would say when, when your teen starts talking about something, your job is to be interested and to be available and to say, interesting, tell me more, you know, and they, may not be looking for advice, but uh, they may be looking for an ear. Often they find us at about 9, 9.30 at night. They'll come in into our room and start talking about their day. And I, I think a, a good job is to, to is just to listen and uh, ask questions and not 
not give a lot of advice. Yeah, and you know, you, you can kind of tell when they're they're looking for advice, but uh, for the most part, they want to be heard. Yeah, and if a teenager is talking to you, that is a good sign because I feel like teenagers kind of have a reputation for maybe not wanting to talk to their parents, you know, things like that. What about um some tips for handling conflict with your teenager? Well, yeah, I would I would say to to listen to that Ask Lisa podcast for for lots of advice, but in in general, um, just know that whatever's going on, you can pause. It's called practice the pause. You don't have to have the answer at the moment. You don't have to actually give your teen, you know, the um, the punishment or the consequence. Uh, if you don't actually know what you want to do, you can kind of just pause and say, you know, I'm going to think about that and get back to you. So I, I think knowing that we don't always have to be so reactive because our, our teens, they, they definitely don't have the life experience to be able to judge the importance of whatever situation they're they're going through and so uh, little things are a big deal to our teens and their friends and their social life are a huge part of um, who they are and, and things that may seem trivial to to us aren't to them and to just you know try to remember how it was I think is is good advice. Does that have anything to do with like how their brains are working or developing at that time or is it just you know human nature? Yeah well their, their frontal cortex isn't fully developed till 25. I, I make the joke that insurance companies car insurance companies definitely know uh, <laughs> know that because of the the rates to ensure our teen drivers are, are very high their brain isn't isn't fully developed their neurons aren't fully pruned and until their mid-20s again I'm not a parent but you know maybe teenagers are viewed as like some of the most healthy individuals because they're still young and whatnot so um, why is it important for teenagers and parents to get their teenagers to keep getting those visits I mean you have to get them for school and stuff for the most part but why why is this important and for teenagers to still kind of keep doing that through their teenage years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, so what do we do at a, at a, at a teen checkup? Well, we, we screen for high-risk activities and we screen for mood issues and we check in on somebody's, you know, height and weight and we look at their vac- vaccination status. And of course, we'll do the sports physical forums and any other paperwork you need for your sports or activities. Um, and then, then we spend time building rapport with our teens, um, especially we want them to have a relationship relationship with us because when they're 16, 17, 18, and they're maybe involved in some type of high risk activity and they feel like uh, perhaps they can't easily go to a parent, we want to be a trusted adult. Um, and, you know, I always say that we are going to, you know, give the same good advice as their, their parents um, would, um, but we're, we're neutral and we give scientific advice and, you know, we understand the, you know, the developmental stage that they're, that they're in. And so, yeah, we're, we hope to be a trusted adult and all those checkups, you know, coming in every year, 10, 11, 12, 13, help build that relationship. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why we think uh, checkups are so important. I, I did want to talk about how there's a lot of screening tools that we have to get ready for a checkup. Um, and so there's a process called e-check-in before you arrive to your visit at Essentia Pediatrics and really uh, likely any family practice or internal medicine, they they all have questionnaires to fill out before visits. And it's important to, to do those. The teen will have one to fill out. Parents have one to fill out. And when you've done that, you're kind of already thinking about the visit. Um, and then we, we have that information so that your check-in process goes smoothly so that there's not a lot of wait before before you see the medical provider because those questionnaires are filled out. So that's called the check-in. That's that's really important to um, do before a checkup. And of course, bringing in all the forms that you may um, need us uh, to fill out. That also kind of cuts down on the, like, I know I get nervous when I'm sitting in a waiting room filling all that out. So that kind of uh, takes that out as well. I want to backtrack a little bit because, I mean, what, what technically is the age of a teenager? 13? Or is that just what it sounds like? Like, what, what is scientifically a teenager, I guess. Well, I would say closer to um, 11. You know, we call it, you know, kind of your preteen. We certainly start doing things a little bit different at age 11. In in our clinic, there's something called the Adolescent Health Review. This is a computer-based screening tool we use that looks at 30 different risk domains. And the teen will fill it out and then we'll have a snapshot of, are they smoking? Are they drinking? Are they sexually active? Are they truant? Uh, do they have a mood disorder? We, you know, this is a screen. And so you take that information and then we base our 
questions to the team based on their answers. And, you know, the state of Minnesota has required by law to provide confidential care in certain areas, and, and that's drug and alcohol use, sexual activity, and, and mood issues. So if our teen shares something with us um, in those areas, we need to provide confidential care. Now, now each pediatrician is going to, you know, talk to the teen and, you know, give that good advice, ask the teen, is this something that we can share with your parents? And um, certainly if there's suicidality or the teen threatens to harm themselves or others, then we need to explain to the teen that we need to break confidentiality and, and share with the parents. Um, but that that confidential um, health care in those areas is a, is, is a guaranteed right um, for that teenager. Yeah, I think that's important. Just like thinking back on when I was a teenager, you know, you, you feel like your doctor, you can trust them with things you maybe wouldn't tell your parents. So starting at age 11, can you kind of walk us through like what a visit looks like from 11 maybe till somebody's unofficially no longer a teenager and they have to move on? Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll come in and like I said, hopefully you'll, you've done e-check-in and you'll have your forms um, ready. Um, in Minnesota, it's um, you need a sports physical food uh, before seventh grade and before 10th grade. And um, hopefully you'll have a list of questions that you were going to ask about, you know, we certainly have our agenda for the the well child checks with um, all the development things we talk about and safety counselings and vaccines. Um, but, you know, if you have a, a question, you want to um, be sure to talk about like your, your menstrual cycle or acne or rash or wart that you want treated, um, then yeah, we kind of do some agenda setting at the beginning of the appointment and focus on those things. And um, like I said, we're, uh, we screen kids um, with that adolescent health review and the parents get a questionnaire to, to make sure that, that, uh, uh, any concerns that they have um, are addressed as well. So after all of that work, now we start the visit and we, we spend t- time talking about, you know, diet and exercise and, and mood and um, school and sleep. Sleep's huge. And then we'll um, do the physical exam. And then, you know, it really depends on the age and comfort of the um, of the, the young person, whether or not the parent is in the room for their physical exam. Certainly at 11 or 12, that's, that's pretty common. But we do ask um, every time if they want the parent to um, step out for for all or part of the exam. And uh, certainly in, in the later ages, we're going to spend some time alone with the teen. If it's not the exam, then there'll be a, a different um, few minutes that we spend alone with the, the teen so that we can um, make sure there's nothing they want to share with us that they are, you know, uh, find it difficult to share with their parents so that we can we can give, give good health care. And uh, after that, we uh, have the parents um, back in the room and we wrap up and uh, give vaccines. And and, and then, yeah, if there's a, another appointment that, that needs to be scheduled, we sure do that. I want to talk about um, health care transition now because there is a point when they age out and they have to go see somebody else. Is that hard for you? It's got both ends, right? You know, it's hard to see them leave and, and you get a little choked up sometimes with um, kids that you've helped through some hard things. Most of the time we, we're transitioning, I, I'm transitioning them to a colleague that I know that's going to do a great job with them. And I've exchanged uh, information with that adult provider so that it's a warm handoff that a new provider is expecting the patient. So that that feels really good. I, I tell you, the situation where it hits home the most is transitioning our patients and families with special health care needs. So these are, these are patients who uh, perhaps uh, were uh, born with a congenital abnormality that makes uh, their learning different, their speech different. Maybe they're differently, have different abilities in their physical activity. You know, maybe they're in a wheelchair, maybe they're on a dozen medications. Maybe they have a G tube or a VP shunt or some other really complex medical issue that you've helped them with for many many years. So it's it's interesting to think we with our most complex patients we actually start thinking about transition even earlier than we do with a, a typical uh, teen. We just have a lot more work to do because these um, patients and families have probably a half a dozen pediatric specialists that need to switch over to adult care. Uh, we need to find. Uh, um, uh, them an adult physician who understands their medical um, issues and is willing um, to take on a complex patient like that. So there's a lot a lot of legwork that goes in. And these families, they do not want to leave pediatrics. The vast majority of the time, um, they're very pleased. They know our nurses. They 
know our clinical assistants. They know us. Uh, they know several of, the, of my pediatric partners. And so that's something when, when we transition our, our uh, families with special health care needs. But it's it's gratifying. It's, it's a very scary time that we walk through the families with. And typically we come out on the other side with a su- successful transition. And that's that's the thing. If, if you don't uh, want to go to the next adult doctor that you've um, gone to a few times, we can always help you have a transition to somebody else. So this process is called HCT Healthcare Transition. I guess I didn't even think, you know, there was such a process behind it, but it looks like there really is based on what you just said. It's interesting to think that uh, young adults are the most underserved population in healthcare. Uh, they tend to leave uh, their f- pediatrician and not know who to go to, or they move away for a job or to go to college and they, they don't transition their health care because they kind of feel like they're invincible. But when you when you think of the things that harm them, it's it's high risk activities, it's accidents and firearm injuries and other high risk activities that we want to continue to be able to counsel so that they can make the best choices that they can. And they, they tend to use the emergency room more than is, you know, optimal um, for So instead of getting a typical health care, they, they use emergency rooms. So we, we really need to, you know, all of us step up our game and, and helping um, young people, um, you know, learn to be independent in their health care. And that, that includes, you know, getting their own MyChart account so that they can um, learn at 16, 17, how to email their doctor questions, how to schedule online, um, how to look up their own lab results. Um, all, all of those things are skills that at, you know, 16, 17, 18, we're going to be teaching your teen when they um, come into clinic so that they can navigate their own health care. I mean, when, when they're transitioning off to college, we would love for them to be like, oh yeah, I got my health care down. I've been managing my own health care uh, with my pediatrician for the last year. That That's really comforting to the to the family to know that that's already happened. It's it's a special interest of mine to help young people navigate their health care and become independent in that way. So you kind of just touched on this, but is there like anything in particular, like a few examples of how you do that? I mean, obviously you're with them for a long period of time, but like, how do you encourage them kind of as they take that next leap to stick with their health care? You know, I mean, you, you do a little bit at a time, you know, so perhaps a 15 year old's in and you can chat with them how things went with COVID and were they able to do a virtual visit with the pediatric department during COVID? Um, And um, sometimes they have and sometimes they haven't. And then we give examples of what would be a good um, video visit um, opportunity, such as perhaps you need a a rash looked at. Well, you can upload a picture uh, to my chart and then have a, have a video visit with us. And, you know, it's neat. You're, You're home. You didn't, you didn't spend an hour going back and forth to the doctor and, and sitting in a waiting room. We we just kind of beam into you. So rashes are excellent for um, video visits. Um, we um, do a lot of um, ADHD and um, mental health follow-up via virtual visits. So um, it's wonderful for healthcare equity to know that um, some people do have barriers to go to the doctor, whether it's um, lack of transportation or, or gas money or um, childcare for their other children while they're trying to get, you know, perhaps their teen to the doctor. Doctor. So the, the virtual visits are a wonderful addition and we're so happy that the that the lawmakers have, you know, promised that we'll continue to be reimbursed even now after COVID for our telephone and uh, virtual visits because it's a huge part of healthcare that we that we hope never never goes away. Yeah, I think that goes even for like adults too, you know, because if you're sick and you can't go in or it's, it is just very convenient and pro- hopefully will help people that maybe are scared of the doctor or, you know, can't get there, like you said, to stay on top of their health. So as we wrap things up here, what are just some take home points that you have that um, anybody listening should know about um, when it comes to um, teens and, and health care and everything like that? I would say that you know, let's get those sports physicals um, done with earlier in in the summer. We do have immediate openings um, now and in June and in early July, but come August, those appointments uh, for sports physicals, uh, they tend to uh, be hard to get. So yeah, make appointments now. I I, I do want to say we have uh, four pediatricians um, that joined Essentia in our Essentia local Duluth practice um, in the last year. So we do have excellent availability to be seen by a pediatrician. Yeah, let's, let's do that 
that e-check-in that I talked about. It makes a visit go a lot uh, more smooth and you'll be in and out of your visit um, more quickly. Wearing a tank top and shorts to your to your visit. Maybe you don't have to put on that, that large uh, gown that, that covers you up even more than a, a t-shirt and shorts. So th- those are some tips and um, come come with your questions. Uh, yeah, and we're, we're just always, always happy to see you. Yeah, those are very, very good tips. Pediatrician Dr. Char Valentine, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you.